presence of the divine in all that we are and in all that we do and in all that surrounds us. As our opening song said, I am remembering who I am. And as in each and every one of us here remembers who they are, their divine center, their eternal selves, we share that light with all those around us. It is never an individual act. It is what creates us in divine community. And so knowing that, I give thanks for this morning for all those here in this room who participate and for all those who join us in community. For truly, that gathering of the light is a felt presence. It is what binds us one to the other and allows us to celebrate the light that we are, the light that we know, and all the blessings of this life. So some, from that place of great openness and gratitude, we give thanks, and together we say, and so it is. So today is Valentine's Day, which isn't always considered a real holiday, but more of an opportunity to sell flowers and chocolates, and a good excuse to go out to dinner with your sweetheart. But this year, circumstances have arisen that have prompted me to contemplate how we couple and connect beyond the level of the physical personality level self, the self that gets to eat chocolate and go to dinner. I've been wondering about how the eternal aspect of us travels in tandem with another, how the soul and soulmate can express as we are embodied and can also persist even after one partner has moved beyond the physical realm. I recognize that this soulmate connection is not necessarily a universal experience in every lifetime, just as being a parent isn't every person's experience, but for those so gifted, it is a particular kind of grace. The catch is, there's a toll to the gift, for the deeper the experience of this interwoven love, the more piercing the pain when the thread of human connection is severed. I had been bearing witness to this of late because a few weeks ago, a dear friend went skiing on a powder day on Baldy and never came home. His wife is reeling from her loss. As one can imagine, she is in shock, disbelief, and overwhelm, awash in a sea of grief. But she is open, and in her openness to moving through what is before her, we have spent time together in friendship and in healing and we have not been alone. The presence of her husband has been with us, palpable and profound. And that is what I want to reflect upon on this Valentine's Day, the eternal nature of these closely held connections, the relationship of souls, the eternal bond tucked inside the temporal human relationship, the bond that thrives in our lifetime and I believe survives our passing. In his memoir, Man's Search for Meaning, Victor Frankl writes of surviving Auschwitz and reflects upon all that made that possible. For him, love was part of what made that possible. Though his wife did not survive the camps, Frankl had this to say about the sustaining power of such a deeply connected love as theirs. He said, Love goes very far beyond the physical person of the beloved. It finds its deepest meaning in the beloved's spiritual being, their inner self. Whether or not they are actually present, whether or not they are still alive at all, ceases somehow to be of importance. As Fungal experienced, I have come to believe that these deeply held connections stand uninterrupted and undeterred by the veil between ourselves and the world beyond this one. This does not mean we do not miss, achingly miss, the beloved who has passed. We miss their physical presence, their companionship, and comfort. But in their passing, we are gifted with their distilled and eternal ever presence. There is a lightness to the love that comes to us from the other side, unencumbered as it is by life's small concerns, no longer needing to thread its way through the daily distractions of living. Instead, we are in receipt of love in all of its eternal, God-like levity, as it embraces without reserve the well-being of the beloved. My friend who recently passed used to tell his wife, God loves you and wants you to be happy. 
His presence in spirit is a reiteration and a reassurance of that truth. While today we reflect upon soulmates, what we might call the eternal Valentine, let us remember that there are many flavors and expressions of love, all worthy of celebration and all to be honored. Every time love speaks to us and expresses through us, it expands us into the heart of the infinite, that place of our common source. So let us celebrate as we experience all the love that comes our way, knowing that as we give it and receive it, as we live in gratitude for it, we are drawn ever deeper into the infinite embrace of the divine, where as souls we travel at times in tandem, but always in unity and in community. And now we have an affirmation. I will read. I am open to the promise that each new thought holds, to the freedom of every untethered idea, and to the excitement felt when taking a path that is yet to be traveled. It's kind of a little piece of Valentine, isn't it? Thank you, R.L. Thanks, John. Good morning, everybody, and happy Valentine's Day to everybody. I don't have candy to hand up. Why don't I have candy to hand up? <laughs> I thought, oh my gosh. Happy Valentine's to all of you, uh, all of you, and to realize it can be a lot of different things. And so this week I thought a bit about how actually sweet Valentine's Day was in like second grade, third grade, fourth grade. That it became a practice in our grade school item. They did it at other grade schools that we would exchange Valentines with each other. But um, it was not a, a Valentine of, you know, declaring your love or relationships. It was just to be nice. And there was an unwritten rule about handing out Valentines in second, third, and fourth grade is that if you didn't hand them out to everybody, you weren't to hand them out. And there was this wonderful kind of equalizing thing about this. So, and unfortunately, even in the second, third, and fourth grade, you started to have your own subgroups. But if you were like the, I don't know, the awkward, nerdy kid, you went home with as many Valentines as supposedly the more popular kid was. I mean, it was really quite, quite wonderful. And, and, even for, and I was somewhere in between. I wasn't like here, and I wasn't like the complete nerdy kid. But... Um, but to, to someone to give me a Valentine in third grade who I wasn't really, didn't have that much connection with, it was like, wow. It was even better if there was that little piece of candy. Remember those little, you know, pure sugar, little hard things? I think they still make them. And those were, those were the best kind anyway. But it was wonderful. I mean, it, it was such a, a great thing that it didn't matter who you were, you came home with as many Valentines as anyone else in class. But the practice started to to, you know, go away as we got into like fifth or even sixth grade especially, but suddenly there was a bit of baggage around Valentine's Day. Now, you, do you remember like around sixth grade it was like, gee, Mary, I think Bobby likes you. I don't usually do air quotes, but they like you. You know what that meant, don't you? It's like, there's this, ooh, those little butterfly feelings. I don't even think we knew what that meant, but we, we were starting to get those little butterflies like, ooh, what if they like you? And it was the real gossip of, oh, I wonder if so-and-so likes it. Like, oh, they picked up her book. Does that mean he likes her or, or whatever? I'm like, this craziness. So even imagine if you were giving Valentine's to everybody, there might be that extra thing. Like, but when Bobby gave Susie the Valentine, gee, you know, what could that have meant? Sort of thing. So I think we just started to not do that because of that. But I think that shows a, a larger thing that was starting to happen is that there are such an amazing thing, especially for second year, at least for me, is my remembrances of. Um, of just being a kid. I know a lot of kids are, are grow up in situations where they can't, they have so many troubles at home. But by, for second grade, it was pretty neat, neat and pretty magical for me. And there wasn't even this idea that there would be an anxiety of giving someone a, a Valentine's of what they might think. It was just this great thing. But as we go a little bit further, as we get a little bit older, we start to collect this baggage, in a sense. We start to, uh, to pick up self-doubts. We actually start to think that we might not be good at something. 
um, simply because of even who we are, that these voices that we start to hear, people tell us things, and as we get a little bit older, we start to unfortunately actually believe them. And I remember something, an event that uh, happened in sixth grade, that I look back now and I think, talk about the accumulation of baggage that can happen. So, like all grade school kids, we would get report cards three or four times a year. I have no idea. Mostly, it was something very private and personal that uh, I remember the, the, the nuns would hand out. They'd be in these little envelopes, and you would take them to your parents. And, you know, it was between you and your parents sort of thing. You didn't necessarily go out in the schoolyard and, you know, have the big reveal. But for some reason, I remember in sixth grade, uh, it was decided that the parish priest would come and hand out report cards. And our parish priest, there was like a staff of priests in those days, and the, and the pastor was, oh, well, I guess if I can think of it now, if Darth Vader existed in sixth grade, this, he would have been Darth Vader. That he just, just the mere sight of him just put fear in our hearts as children. I mean, he was the ultimate, like, old guy that yells at kids to get off his lawn. And, and I honestly don't remember, and it was the pastor the whole time I was in grade school from, you know, eight, eight, eight grades. I don't ever remember him smiling or telling, or at least even attempting to tell a funny story from the pulpit. It was pretty much the old guy telling people to get off the lawn. And so he was coming to give out report cards. And and it wasn't anonymous in a sense. So there was this just, I think, just actually terrible morning where one by one you would be called up, you would look at it and make commentary about your grades. Now, even I usually had pretty good, good grades, and it was frightening for me, you know, to have Darth Vader look at my things here. But I just still remember some of those, those kids that were struggling in their academics and to be called out for it in front of a whole classroom. I mean, yes, kids, you kind of knew who was having trouble, but I can't imagine what they then walked away with and home with, this feeling of being only called to the carpet by, by the parish priest and basically being told that, you know, they just weren't good in some way. And, that, and how that might just accumulate from a moment like that. And and thinking of that, that reminds me of so many of the conversations that I have with people through the years, especially as being a minister, of people sharing moments with me like that, that something started within them that created so much difficulty for them, that it started as what we call this voice in the head of telling you that it doesn't matter you know, how much you try, you're not good enough, or you can't, or you're not talented enough in some way, and how regardless of how we quote-unquote try to get ahead, how that voice, that inner critic, that inner judge of jury, and jury just seems to take over. So I started reading a, a book this week um, called The Surrender Experiment by Michael Singer, and I'm sure many of you have read his book, The Untethered Soul. It's been a popular one for quite some time. And this book, at least the part that I'm reading right now, is the discussion of this, really this inner critic, this voice in the head. And it was so funny how in this first chapter he writes about how he, I guess, discovered the voice in the head. Even though we all experience this to some extent, that he, in his early 20s, I guess, became aware of actually this voice in his head. I mean, we all, again, have things, these feelings that possibly that we're not good enough or something in some way. But it suddenly became to him like almost this disembodied spirit in his head of telling him that, well, why are you doing this? You should have made a different decision, whatever. And it only, he got fascinated with it. It was like, wow, there's this voice in my head. In fact, he would start to ask anyone he would come in contact with, and quote here, have you ever noticed that there's this voice talking inside your head? I mean, it was just like he was, you know, he needed to see if other people were having this, and it was almost this fascination to a point of, you know, it doesn't even matter that it's negative. What's this weird voice in my head? Why is it saying all these sort of things? And I would imagine that his friends thought he was, you know, maybe losing it a little bit, 
But when you think of it, even though if it's not necessarily a booming voice that you hear like he was becoming aware of, we have all aware of these feelings that at times might not be telling us the truth. And again, if you've had anything from your past that, that didn't go well, then it coming up and saying, well, you know, why try or whatever. So as, as he was writing further, of course, this was the beginning of, of his road in, in more consciously a spiritual life, because his question was, what would life be like if that voice went away? And even as he's still having it, again, what would it be like if it was no longer there? And if you think about it, most of people that, as we are trying to have what we call a spiritual practice, prayer, meditation, however you would, you would, you would categorize it, most of us have as kind of a prime goal is to quiet that voice in the head. I mean, think about it. And as we teach meditation here in some classes that we do, the biggest feedback we have or frustration is that not only do am I still hearing the voice in the head when I sit down to try to meditate for my first time, it seems to get louder. In fact, now it seems to almost like I've given it permission to just have a party in my head. You know, I, I kind of ignored it a little bit before. There's nothing like sitting down saying, I'm going to be in the silence for it to go, ah, the moment I've been waiting for. I'm really going to get to you now. And so, again, he talks about this journey and it, our shared journey of the spiritual practice being just slowly lowering the volume and how that can change your life and how it affects so much and how it, it seems that that voice seems to come in contrast to what we also feel that we're doing in the spiritual practice and in science of mind that you know, our little saying is, you know, change your thinking, change your life, that as you change your your beliefs about yourself and the world, that amazing things will happen, and that you can, in a sense, have many wonderful things manifest in your life, which I believe to be true. But part of this is not, not, not part of it. It's not so much to say, gee, how can I get a new house? The change your thinking, change your life is actually geared at the voice in the head. That's what's, in a sense, standing in the way. That's where the work is. It's not about just having, I guess, a vision board of how we physically want our lives to look at and, like, you know, affirm it till we're blue in the face kind of thing. It's this change your thinking, change your life is, okay, what's the underlying thing that I'm thinking about? What have I been told that's not true that I have come to believe that is true? That our spiritual practice is about getting to that core idea of what do I really believe and what is it that I really want in my life. It's interesting, he writes here, uh, Michael Singer, says that it's as if, though, we actually believe that the world around us is supposed to manifest according to our own likes and dislikes. If it doesn't, surely something is very wrong. This is an extremely difficult way to live, and it is the reason we feel that we are always struggling with life. Now, at first, this sounds a little bit contrary to often what we'll teach. Like we say that as we energetically change who we are, amazing things can manifest in our life. But you can't do it halfway. He says, now it's as though we actually believe that the world around us is supposed to manifest according to our own likes and dislikes. But when, if we, when we ponder this, we think that we should be able to create a life without having to do the work on those things that aren't serving us, those ideas, that the universe should react to what I say I want as opposed to what I really believe. So in this starts to come sometimes the difficult and soul-searching work of, okay, what have I been led to believe, really. And as opposed to that, what is it that I really want here? And what we really want usually has very little to do with, you know, 
to say princess, princesses, parking lots, and palaces kind of thing. It really, really has to do with the physical things in our life. And not to say that those things aren't important. You know, we all should have, I think, life and meaning. We all should have a well-supplied life. We all should have great things in our life physically that, that we are enjoying. But that's not the main event of it. So whatever you think you say you want in the physical world, the thing is to ask yourself, what is the underlying desire that you're making for that you think that that will fulfill? One um, example I often use in classes is, so you want a new car. What does that mean to you? Really, what does that mean to you? Growing up with my father, it meant my father bought cars that he thought would impress people. He wanted people to think he had a lot of money. So something tells me there was an idea of belief very deep down there that he probably should have spent more time working on. Something, a desire or a feeling about who he was or who he was lacking in some way that he thought was going to be filled by the really expensive car. So we would ask ourselves, what is it that I really desire here? And that desire for me is about knowing that I have self worth knowing that it can show up in regardless of anything that I do, knowing that I can have a secure life regardless of what, how my career or things, other things show up. So to start to ask yourself, what is it you really want? Because I know that we've all, in a sense, maybe desired a physical object. And there, again, there's nothing wrong with physical objects, but we just thought it was going to do something for us. And as nice as it was, there was still something lacking. Now, it's, it reminds me of, uh, again, as, as kids, making out the Christmas list. I just know my life will be changed by this new toy. Forgetting that there were so many toys in our toy box and closet that we didn't even know what to do with what we had. But this new toy was really going to do it, kind of thing. So, what, you know, of course we were just kids. But what does the new toy in your life that you think that you want, what does that really represent? You know, how is that going to be better than the old toy? So, part of this quieting that inner voice is to ask ourselves again, what is it that we really desire? And, especially since it's Valentine's Day, to begin to just entertain the idea that you have enough self-love to know that you deserve it and can have it, can have it right now. So as we seek to silence this voice, Here's something that you can do that, for some reason, I don't think we do enough of. You know, there's other really great voices in your head. For every teacher that told you you couldn't, I know there's one that told you you could. I know I've got a lot of those. And I know that possibly that you may be carrying something in your brain that a parent told you. But I bet they also told you something really good as well at some point. But sometimes that negative is so loud that we forget about the other. So if you go to sit in quiet or meditation and those negative voices come up, start to look for those great voices, those supportive voices. And it's funny how the negative voices we have allowed to be so loud that we may have completely forgotten about those great voices, those encouraging voices. I mean, there are some lines that I, that I hold in my head of, from people who supported me in times of great difficulty that it changed everything. It really did. It changed everything. And I still, even some of those things that I was told 50 years ago, I still go back to them because that person changed everything in that moment in my life because of the one positive thing they said compared to maybe the 10 negative things that someone else said. But I hold on to those positive things. And to then to even take it a 
bit further. Michael Singer also writes, My personal experience is that aligning one's will with the natural forces unfolding around us leads to some surprisingly powerful results. So what does that mean? I've really gotten away from using prayer as a means where I seek to get stuff. Life has a way of putting the physical things that I need right in front of me. In fact, in ways that are really, truly miraculous of how things show up. So my prayers are, in a sense, as he writes about, to be able to listen to something deeper within me. To be able to be in a greater flow of life, of this, this whole universe and spirit or God or whatever you, you refer to it, that has a better idea than I do. I believe, as Michael writes, that this power that created the universe has creation pretty much down. It's figured it out. It's ever creating in perfection, even though we at times might judge it not to be so. And I think if I was going to put money in the stock, this would be a good stock to put money in. This power and force that has already created everything in perfection. And that maybe this little human person of me, that that might be a good example. Maybe I should give over my trust to that, that who knows if it can create the universe, maybe it could be more helpful in co-creating my life right here and right now. That Michael Singer also writes about getting away from what he calls creating these, these alternate universes of existence that we have that are based on these negative thoughts that we have in our mind. That maybe we should come to, I guess, the real universe of creation that is ever creating perfection for everyone. And maybe, as the, you know, the title of this book, calling The Surrender Project, maybe part, a big part of my spiritual practice should be to give up the grasping on trying to create as a response to those negative things in my head. And as you do, amazing things happen. That you notice that there is a greater flow to kind of get on. I mean, it's like, imagine, you know, put your raft in the river and just kind of go with it as opposed to trying to paddle upstream. Does that make a little bit of sense? And know that as you're on that stream, yes, it's, it's not like you don't make decisions. There are many choices in the, you know, the flow of life, but there is an, um, truly a magical sense of creation when you're going with the stream as opposed to going against it. And again, we're always going against it when we're telling ourselves that we're not worthy or we're not good enough or not lovable in some way. You're going upstream. And it never really works out that way. Now, Ernest Holmes writes in, in talking about manifestation through prayer, he says, we must become the thing we want. We must see it, think it, realize it, before the creative power of mind can work it out for us. Now, we misinterpret this sometimes, that people will think, gee, I must see it and think it. So, without doing real inner work, it's like, oh, gee, I want this house, or I want this car, or I want this, this job, and I just see myself going to work there, or I see myself driving the car, or I'm living in that neighborhood, without realizing that what he says is that you want to energetically become that which you are seeking. And for positive growth in your life, that means that you've given up those negative voices. Becoming that positive idea that you are capable, that you can, that there's no reason that you can't. That's what it is about becoming it. I mean, prayer is not magic. It's actually just getting out of the way. I mean, that's really what it is. And I also know that you've all had this experience of wanting something so badly, not getting it, or wanting it at least with your human ego self, not getting it, and years later going, boy, did I dodge a bullet. The best answer prayer was not to have gotten it. 
So when you're in that flow and listening less and less to those negative voices, you start to have those things happen. And part of it just, so start to give up the struggle now. So it's not necessarily like, gee, it has to be quiet right now. Just realize that it's something that's not true. This is something that has no power for me. This is not true, whatever it is. And know that if you're going into a situation where you have to, you know, kind of give, give up your, give your courage up a little bit, and that voice is saying, ah, you can't, you know, I've been times in my car just said, shut up already. <laughs> just stop. You know, people looking around, I can see in the car, like, stay away from him. And it might even take that, you know, just stop it already. Put it to the side. Let me just close with one more thing from um, Michael Singer, Singer's book. He says, am I better off making up an alternate reality in my mind and then fighting with the reality to make it be my way? Or am I better off letting go of what I want and serving the same forces of reality that managed to create the entire perfection of the universe around me? The experiment would not be about dropping out of life. It would be about leaping into life, to live in a place where we are no longer controlled by our personal fears and desires. For lack of a better name, I call this the surrender experiment. So, and this is a perfect time in history to do it. That's for another day. So let's just take this one thing for a moment. So as we recognize that there is a power in the universe around us, in every cell of our body and in the universe. And it is a power that is there for us to co-create. And it is so effortless. We simply can't allow it to be our loving partner in creating life. The first cipher for us that we do what is most important that is to listen to listen to its voice, to listen to encouraging voices, and know that anything that is not encouraging or anything that is not from the life and breath of spirit is not true, and it is false, and we let it fall away. And in this amazing time, time of history, I affirm for us that we all surrender to the deeper lessons, the deeper things that we are creating right now knowing that, even when it doesn't appear to be, it's actually perfect. Amazing things happen as we go with the stream. So I give thanks for this this morning. I give thanks for each person here. I give thanks for the true lovability of each person on this planet, and especially we're with us here on live stream this morning. And as I give thanks, I let it go. It into the creative medium, I release it to the heart of my spirit, and as I release it, I know it is perfect, and so it is.